Good morning. Irenaeus's metaphor of God acting with his two hands, the Son and the Holy Spirit, is universally renowned. This apparently simplistic anthropomorphic image is used by Irenaeus to express the fact that God himself acts in the economy without the need of intermediate beings. In this paper, we would like to investigate one particular aspect of this metaphor, the fact that while it clearly conveys the Father as the origin of divine action, it establishes no order between the action of the two hands. By contrast, we can think of Tertullian's coeval metaphors of the Trinity, the image of the root, the tree and the fruit, the image of the source, the river and the stream, or the image of the sun, the ray and its apex, which explicitly serve to indicate the sun as second and the Holy Spirit as third with respect to the Father. Unlike these, Irenaeus's metaphor of the two hands poses no clear order between the Son and the Spirit. We ask ourselves, is this a limit in Irenaeus's famous metaphor, or could it rather be an important part of its theological power? To address this issue, we can consider the fact that triadic texts in Irenaeus's works manifest two distinct orders. In the majority of cases, we find the classic order, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But there are some significant instances in which the inverse order appears, Holy Spirit, Son, Father. In a renowned text, Irenaeus speaks of a chronological progression in the vision of God, who is first seen prophetically through the Spirit, then adoptively through the Son, and finally paternally in the kingdom of heaven, the Spirit truly preparing man towards the Son of God, and the Son leading him to the Father, who confers incorruption for eternal life. This text seems to suggest that in the economy as a whole, the Spirit precedes the Son. On an individual level too, there seems to be a similar precedence of the Spirit in those who are saved, who, Irenaeus tells us, ascend through the Spirit to the Son and through the Son to the Father. Also in the demonstration of the apostolic preaching, Irenaeus insists on the Spirit having a precedence on the Son in our going to the Father. He says, There is bestowed on us, God the Father, by means of the new birth through his Son, by the Holy Spirit, because those who bear in themselves the Holy Spirit are led to the Word who is the Son, but the Son leads us to the Father, the Father makes us receive incorruption. Without the Spirit, it is impossible to see the Word of God, and without the Son, one cannot approach the Father, because the Son is the Father's knowledge, but knowledge of the Son is by the Holy Spirit. We could be tempted to interpret these texts as instances of what von Balthasar called economic inversion, in the sense that while in the imminent Trinity, the Son has precedence on the Holy Spirit. In the economy, it is the Holy Spirit who goes first. In his Theodrama, von Balthasar bases such an idea on some texts of the Cappadocian Fathers. But when he recalls the concept of economic inversion in the Theologic, he does so under the Irenaean heading, the two hands of the Father. For von Balthasar, the Lokian account of the Incarnation, which grammatically presents the Son as passive and the Holy Spirit in an active role, is one of the key elements in the proposal of an economic inversion. Therefore, to determine whether it is possible to speak of economic inversion in the theology of Irenaeus, it is worth focusing in on his presentation of the Incarnation. To this end, we have two interesting texts in the Demonstratio. In the first, Irenaeus affirms that the word of God came to Judea, planted by God, by means of the Holy Spirit. The Incarnation is here explicitly a Trinitarian event and takes place per spiritum sanctum, but there is no clear indication of a chronological 
or even just of a logical precedence of the Spirit with respect to the Son. As in John 1.14, in fact, the active subject of the Incarnation in this text is the Son, and the only clear passivity of the Son is with respect to the Father. The text says that the word is seminatus adeo. The fundamental order here remains Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There is, however, another text in which a more active role of the Holy Spirit in the Incarnation emerges. Irenaeus interprets the Messianic prophecy of Isaiah 11.1, 1, identifying the shoot of Jesse with the Virgin Mary, while its flower is the Christ, or more precisely, his flesh generated by the Spirit. Here we do indeed have an active precedence of the Spirit in the Incarnation, However, this is explicitly connected with the flesh to the humanity that is assumed. To interpret such an affirmation, it is worth recalling the important principle expressed by Leo the Great in the Thomas Ad Flavianum. Natura quippe nostra non sic ad sumpta est ut prius creata post ad sumeretur, sed ut ipsa ad sumsione crearetur. The creation of humanity assumed is logically and ontologically dependent on its assumption. This means that the active role of the Spirit in the Incarnation, which Irenaeus explicitly relates to the flesh that is assumed, does not imply a precedence with respect to the Son's assumption of the human nature. For the assumption of the flesh on behalf of the Son has ontological precedence with regard to the nature assumed. Such considerations of the Spirit's precedence in the humanity of Christ bring us to notice that the texts in which we found the order Holy Spirit, Son, Father, always regard a process of divinization in humanity, either taken as a whole or that of the individual. The order Father, Son, Holy Spirit, on the other hand, regards intra-Trinitarian relationships not only in the imminent trinity, but also in the economy. For example, in the previously quoted chapter 7 of the Demonstratio, after speaking of the Holy Spirit leading us to the Son, who in turn brings us to the Father, Irenaeus concludes with a sentence that makes it clear that as far as the intra-trinitarian relationships are concerned, the Spirit depends on the Son, who in turn acts according to the will of the Father. Spiritum autem secundum beneplacitum patris filius ministerialiter dispensat in quos voluerit et quemadmodum voluerit pater. From this and from other texts, it is clear that the order Father, Son, Holy Spirit does not regard solely the imminent Trinity, but also intra-Trinitarian relationships that are at play in the economy. We therefore suggest that one can speak of this order, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, simply as divine taxis, while the inverse order, Holy Spirit, Son, Father, is most precisely qualified as divinizing taxis, an order that appears in reference to the process of divinization in humanity. This twofold order can be observed in the Trinitarian structure of the entire economy of the Incarnate Word, not only in the moment of the Incarnation. Let us examine, for example, the key moment of the baptism of Jesus. When Irenaeus explains that from the baptism of Jesus the Holy Spirit becomes accustomed in fellowship with him to dwell in the human race, we can discern the divine taxis, in the sense that the Holy Spirit can descend in this new way on the human race because the humanity he descends upon is the humanity assumed by the Son. The Spirit cannot descend independently from the Son, nor does he ever go ahead of the Son. However, when Irenaeus presents the aim of the Holy Spirit's action as that of renewing men from their old habits into the newness of Christ, here we have the divinizing taxis, 
the spirit conforms mankind to the son and so that humanity may come to the father. Also in the resurrection, we find this twofold order. According to the divinizing taxis, Jesus is raised from the dead through the spirit's instrumentality. Irenaeus says, quoting Romans 8, 11. But this precedence of the Holy Spirit regards the humanity assumed by the Son, the mortal corruptible flesh, which by the action of the Spirit receives divine sonship. Paraphrasing Romans 1, Irenaeus affirms that Jesus Christ was appointed the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. According to divine taxis, on the other hand, the Spirit's resurrecting action ontologically depends on the Son. This appears from the fact that the Son is the firstborn from the dead, which implies that the Son's being the subject of the resurrection is an ontological condition to the instrumentality of the Spirit, thus manifesting the precedence of the Son with respect to the Spirit, which we have in the divine taxis. In brief, what emerges from many Iranian texts is that throughout the economy of the incarnate word, there is a twofold relationship between the Son and the Holy Spirit. On the one hand, according to the divine taxis, the action of the Spirit ontologically depends on the Son. This appears in the global fact that the Spirit's salvific action in all men is inaugurated and has its foundation in the economy of the Son of God made flesh. On the other hand, according to the divinizing taxis, the Spirit has precedence in fulfilling divine sonship in the humanity that is assumed. This takes place throughout the economy of the incarnate word, from the incarnation through baptism to the resurrection, humanity sustaining and receiving and embracing the Son of God. The divinizing taxis is ontologically, not chronologically dependent on the divine taxis, so that both always proceed together in the economy. What has emerged is a basic pattern that can be applied and verified in other aspects of Irenaeus's theology. In anthropology, we can apply this scheme to man's being created ad imaginem et similitudinem Dei. Taking on board the results of Jacques Fantino's studies on this expression, the imago concerns man's plasma that from the very beginning of creation is proleptically in relation with the incarnate sun, while the similitudo, here standing for the Greek homoiosis, refers to the divinizing dynamism of the Holy Spirit that conforms man to the Son and thus brings him to the Father. The divine taxis implies that the similitudo depends ontologically on the imago. In other words, the Spirit's action in man depends on the fact that by his plasma, man is from the outset proleptically united to the Son. The divinizing taxis, on the other hand, tells us that the similitudo, which the Holy Spirit dynamically operates, is an ever greater configuration to the Son. Thus, the imago is both the foundation and the outcome of the similitudo. Foundation according to the divine taxis, outcome according to the divinizing taxis. Such an analysis helps to theologically interpret and articulate the many Irenaean texts on the Imago and Similitudo Dei. In an anthropological perspective, also the relationship between grace and freedom can be articulated appealing to the divine taxis as permanent foundation of the divinizing taxis. The positive use of man's freedom can be interpreted as the unfolding of the divinizing taxis. And this, ontologically and dynamically, depends on grace, on God's action towards man, according to the divine taxis. Man's freedom in the spirit depends on a preceding word from God. Thus, when Irenaeus speaks about the rational character of freedom, we can see, that, we can see in this 
a manifestation of the ontological dependence of the divinizing taxes on the divine taxes. Freedom has its foundation in reason because the spirit's action has its foundation in the action of the son who is the logos of the father. The relationship between divine taxes and divinizing taxes can be considered more broadly in the history of salvation. Summarizing from Irenaeus's works, we can affirm that the two hands of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, are both active throughout the whole history of salvation, both operating from the beginning in creation that has man's divine sonship as its end. The Spirit's active presence in all the economies of God, even prior to the Incarnation, is never independent from the Son. The Spirit does not go ahead of the Son, who is also actively present ab initio in all the economies of God. In the history of salvation as a whole, we see that according to the divine taxis, the action of the Spirit depends on that of the Son. This most clearly appears in the two divine missions, the Incarnation and the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. It is de abundancia unctionis eius, from the abundance of the unction of the Son, that the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon us in a new way in these last times. In the light of these central events, it is possible to discern that from the outset, the Spirit's role is dependent on that of the Son, according to the divine taxes. And yet, according to the divinizing taxes, Throughout the history of salvation, there is a precedence of the Spirit with regard to the establishment of divine sonship in humanity. We can consider the whole of the Spirit's action before the Incarnation as instrumental to the divine sonship received by the flesh of Jesus Christ, while the Spirit's action after Christ is instrumental to the divine sonship of the whole of humanity that will have its consummation at the resurrection of the dead. According to this basic structure, we suggest it is possible to correlate the whole course of salvation history with the internal economy of the incarnate word. In a famous text, Irenaeus states that the Son of God, quando incarnatus et homo factus, Longam hominum expositionem in se ipso decapitulavit, in compendio nobis salutem prestans. We suggest that in the economy of the incarnate Son, the process from the incarnation to the baptism of Jesus recapitulates the Old Testament from the creation to Jesus Christ, having as its basis the protological plasma assumed by the Son. Then, from his baptism to his resurrection, we are given in compendio the salvation that is inaugurated with the New Testament, going from Jesus Christ to the resurrection of the dead in the parousia. And this has its, as its basis the risen body of Christ that is concretely present in the Church. The unity of the Old and the New Testament, so crucial against the heretics, can thus be founded in the unity of the incarnate Word, who establishes the New Testament while fulfilling the Old. The plasma assumed by the Son, and then the risen body of Christ, provide throughout the history of salvation the foundation according to the divine taxis of the Spirit's divinizing action. On account of the plasma, the Spirit acts in all men, leading them to Jesus Christ. On account of the risen body of Christ that remains present in the Church, the Spirit leads mankind through the Paschal mystery to the fullness of divine sonship in the resurrection of the Parousia. In this way, the Son appears as the Alpha and Omega of the whole economy, Alpha according to divine taxes, Omega according to the divinizing taxes. Metaphysically, this also gives us an interesting perspective 
on the chirological structure of time, in which man's freedom is inserted with the action of the spirit between the foundational sonship of the divine taxes and the acquired sonship of the divinizing taxes. Time and history are constituted between the sun as alpha and the sun as omega, as the chirological duration in which man freely responds to God's free gift of grace in the Holy Spirit. In conclusion, let us return to the metaphor of the two hands. The fact that it does not determine the order between the action of the Son and Holy Spirit can now be seen not as a limit, but rather as part of its theological strength. It is able to express the twofold relationship in the joint action of the Son and the Holy Spirit that runs through the whole economy. It is our hope that the explicatory power of the distinction between the divine taxes and the divinizing taxes, which we were able to indicate only briefly in this paper, may allow us to appreciate anew the force of the famous Iranian metaphor of the two hands of the Father. Thank you very much for your patience and your attention.